is. If you want to turn to John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 1. I'm sorry, verse 12. We'll begin there. 8, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him, who you hear you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony cannot be valid. The Pharisees, I'm sorry, Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they ask, where is your father? And Jesus said, you do not know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one had seized him because his hour had not yet come. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. And that's where we left off last week. We need to believe that Christ is who he says he is. So I want to talk about this question once again. Is Jesus really God? Seriously, do we believe that he is? And I believe that it's incumbent upon us to do that, to believe him. Listen to what I have discovered this week. In the beginning, God, and you can write in your Bible there, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Now, Elohim is the plural form of God with a unique meaning of being more than two people. Then in Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over everything. Here God is speaking with another person. Here Moses used the personal pronouns to define God. Us is the plural of the pronoun me. Our speaks to the forget the togetherness of the us. It is the possessive of us, meaning we belong together. They belong together. They are one. They are us at the same time. The Trinity is in, is the Trinity inferred? Inferred? It is. Is it a good word? I think it is. Some will some will deny that. But each of us have to make our own decision, do we not? This verse implies the pre-existence Jesus is part of the Godhead. Listen to what Paul has written. He is the image of the invisible God. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There's no question will Paul believe that Christ is part of this Godhead. In Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. 
This tells me that man is not the result of an evolutionary theory. We did not evolve from some forms of lower life, as some would have us to think. How does a lower life gain greater knowledge and intelligence than the animals from which he came? This knowledge, this wisdom, and this intelligence is from God and given to man for a purpose, and that is to rule the world that God created. God gave us created and gave us knowledge and intelligence that no animal has ever been reported to have. We are, as human beings, completely unique because of what God has done to and for each of us. God gave man a dominion over all of creation. That is our purpose, to serve and to work the earth and to take care of all the creation, all creation and grow. The plural is also written in Genesis 3.22. And the Lord said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. I don't know that animals love good and evil, but I do know that we are not to love good and evil. But here we know good and evil because of what happened thousands of years ago. And then Isaiah writes, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, I, here I am, send me. This was written at a time of great darkness in Israel, about 740 BC, to give hope and comfort in a time of great uncertainty in the land of Judah. The uncertainty then was somewhat like we are, somewhat like we are experiencing today. Think about ourselves and our times. Do we not need hope, comfort, and the mercy of God? Certainly we do. In like manner, Isaiah was called to preach in Judah. Judah had been going through times of revival and times of rebellion. And now Judah was being threatened with the destruction by Asia, I'm sorry, by Assyria and by Egypt. And in our own time, China and Russia are emerging threats to our way of life. Judah was spared because of God's mercy and let us pray that God will be merciful to America and to the Western cultures of this world. Actually, he will be merciful to us. For all those who believe in him, he will remove before the great tribulation so that we do not have to experience the great tribulation the Bible speaks of that is coming. In Chronicles 7.13, we find what we need to do in a situation like this. The writer says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land and send a plague among my people, here it is, if my people, that's us, who are called by his name, Christians, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. What does it mean to humble ourselves? It means to put others first, always put God in first place. Never do we try to put ourselves in first place, but we always seek to be humble to the will of God, doing the will of God and doing what God has asked us to do. Without humility, we will never be able to take that first step in becoming one who is known by his name. Then pray and seek my face. We need to be always, each and every day, asking God, to reveal himself to us so that we may know him more clearly. And then if we do have wicked ways within us, within our children, we need to speak to that and, and walk from those. And then Christ will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin and heal our land. Those are the instructions. First, Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. Isaiah called people to repent for sin, for repent from sin and to bring hope that God will deliver them in the future. This verse gave hope to the people. Even though the future was far off, they didn't realize that, but yet it was a true statement. They placed all their hope in God for the days that were coming in their near future. I wonder though, if we 
in our own day need to com contemplate our own sin. Most of us would say privately, well, I'm not really that bad a person. I, I really don't sin, but we think we have to think about what we do that offends God and then make changes and ask God to help us with that. Think about our own sin. For it is clear that many people have wandered from the church, wandered from the faith, and much sinful activity today is now embraced and accepted as normal, and even righteousness has been redefined. People now think of righteousness as simply being happy in what you're doing. Many have abandoned the church in favor of personal priorities that govern the Sabbath day rather than the will of God. God's will, God's voice, God's word should guide our lives each and every day. So in the fourth commandment we hear, we read, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. That's all it says, that's the fourth commandment. Are we keeping the Sabbath day holy? Many do not today. We need to speak to that. We need to talk about that. Here's what I found on a Catholic website I thought was kind of interesting. All the commandments of God are serious, are a serious matter. So to deliberately miss Sunday mass or mass on Sunday without a just reason would objectively be considered a mortal sin. Just ponder on that for a while. If we miss church in the Catholic church, that is a mortal sin without just reason. But how many just ignore church for personal priorities in their own lives? Too busy, have other things to do. Happiness rules over my devotion to God. That is a problem. Isaiah refers to the Son as mighty God. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Here, Isaiah refers to this one that is coming, the Son, as Mighty God. More demonstration or more proof that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is God in the flesh. And last week, we read this verse, 8.24 in John. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am, or some add in parentheses, the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. Here's something to think on. It does not say if you do not convert to faith in Christ. It does not say if you do not ask Jesus to come into your heart. And it does not say if you do not ask for forgiveness, you will die in your sins. But what it does say, if you do not believe that I am the one that I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. It all begins with our recognizing that Jesus is God among us. I can't imagine myself being able to worship another man who is just another man on earth, but I can and I do and I feel wonderful when I do worship God can I can begin to see who he is, experience who he is through my understanding of scripture. God is among us. There is no one that will cry over our tears, who will seek to comfort us, who has died for our sins, who has res been resurrected by God the Father, by God the Son, and by the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, to a new light. And in that, he promises that we will have life in eternity forever because of what he has done for us. Is it a requirement to believe Jesus is God to be saved? Something to think about. But some say yes. Some say no. But what do you say when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Listen to what the disciples have written and decide then. John 14, 9, Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am one and the same. Something we can't explain, can't begin to understand. The difficult concept. And then, and then, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, 
The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. But I wonder now if he's blinded the minds of those who have believed in the past and now do not. For the Bible tells us clearly that people will fall away from the faith in the end of days, if in fact we are in those days, which many pastors seem to suggest that we are. The God of the sage has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that it cannot see the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul was convinced that Christ is the very image of God. The writer of Hebrews says, this sun, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And then consider the I am statements we find in that one chapter, chapter 8 of John. Eight times Jesus claims the I am <clears throat> that we find in Exodus 3.14. Listen, I am the light of the world, John 8.12. I am not alone, John 8, 16. I am the one who bears witness of myself, 8, 18. I am from above, 8, 23. I am the Christ, 8, 24. And this one seems to sum it all up when he says, I am. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up their stones to stone him. Why would they do that? because of his claim that he is God himself. Before Abraham was born, I am. And that's, that, these are the words that God used when he told Moses to go and tell the people who he was. He said, tell them that I am that I am. Go and tell the people that is who I am. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. He's certainly talking to the Jews. This made the Jew ask, will he kill himself? Is that what he says? Where I go, you cannot come. But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that so that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. Jesus here is claiming his pre-existence by taking God's name, the I am. <clears throat> we find is God's name throughout scripture. Listen to Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is our, what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So the Jews would have no question in their mind who Jesus was claiming to be in those eight claims that Jesus made about himself in John chapter 8. Jesus is saying, I am that I am. I am who I am. So in conclusion, we may deny that Jesus is God, but we cannot deny that Jesus said he was God. In denying all that Jesus did and said, essentially is denying God himself. If Jesus is not God, can we trust anything? That's written about him. Without his resurrection, what hope do we have for eternal life? None. No other record talks about eternal life and that those who seek it are forgiven. How do we account for what the disciples said and did? They all died a violent death, including John, who is the latest. Why would they go about the world of that time, preaching Christ in the face of death because they knew they saw something. That something happened in their hearts and minds when they recognized that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Jesus was not a prophet or a good man. He was much more than that. I have given you a handout. I'd like to read that through for you. It comes from C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. He writes the following, am I, I am here to prevent some, anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, Jesus Christ. I am, I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral, these who would say about him, I'm ready to accept 
Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. Some people say that. This is one thing that C.S. Lewis says we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said these sort of things, Jesus said, would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, madman, or something else. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. Father, we thank you for your word today. We ask now that you would just reveal it to us throughout this week. Help us to think about the fact that you are certainly God, that you have claimed to be God, that you have done things in our lives that only God can do, such as forgiving sins and giving us hope and encouraging words through your spirit. We thank you, Father, for sending Jesus who died for our sins that we may be forgiven and that we can participate in eternal life as we live obedient to, obediently to the word of Christ. So help us, Father, to live in obedience to all that he says. Help us to live with hope and the comfort that you love us and you will not abandon us no matter what happens in our life. Lord, it just seems that we are in a time when it appears that maybe the tribulation is uh, in, the, in the works and that it may happen before too long. So help us, Father, to be faithful to the end and keep us faithful throughout all that takes place in our future. Give us hope, give us courage, give us the boldness to go and to share this message with other people who do not know who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.